Hello friends, today I am reading class 11, chapter 3, Discovering Tooth. The saga continues by A. R. Williams. Notice these expressions in the text. Infer their meaning from the context. Forensic reconstruction, scudded across, casket grey, resurrection, funerary treasures, Circumvented, computed tomography, eerie detail. He was just a teenager when he died, the last heir of a powerful family that had ruled Egypt and its empire for centuries. He was laid to rest, laden with gold and eventually forgotten. Since the discovery of his tomb in 1922, the modern world has speculated about what happened to him, with murder being the most extreme possibility. Now, leaving his tomb for the first time in almost 80 years, Tooth has undergone a CT scan that offers new clues about his life and death and provides precise data for an accurate forensic reconstruction of the boyish pharaoh. An angry wind stirred up ghostly dust devils as King Tut was taken from his resting place in the ancient Egyptian cemetery known as the Valley of Kings. Dark-bellied clouds had scudded across the desert sky all day and now were veiling the stars in casket grey. It was 6 p.m. on 5th January 2005 the world's most famous mummy glided headfirst into a CT scanner brought here to probe the lingering medical mysteries of this little understood young ruler who died more than 3,300 years ago. All afternoon, the usual line of tourists from around the world had descended into the cramped, rock-cut tomb some 26 feet underground to pay their respects. They gazed at the murals on the walls of the burial chamber and peered at Tut's gilded face, the most striking feature of his mummy-shaped outer coffin lid. Some visitors read from guidebooks in a whisper. Others stood silently, perhaps pondering Tut's untimely death in his late teens or wondering with a shiver if the pharaoh's curse, death or misfortune falling upon those who disturbed him was really true. The mummy is in very bad condition because of what Carter did in the 1920s, said Zahi Hawass, Secretary General of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, as he leaned over the body for a long first look. Carter, Howard Carter, that is was the British archaeologist who, in 1922, discovered Tooth's tomb after years of futile searching. Its contents, though hastily ransacked in antiquity, were surprisingly complete. They remain the richest royal collection ever found and have become part of the pharaoh's legend. Stunning artifacts in gold, their eternal brilliance meant to guarantee resurrection caused a sensation at the time of the discovery and still get the most attention. But Tooth was also buried with everyday things he'd want in the afterlife. Board games, a bronze razor, linen undergarments, cases of food and wine. After months of carefully recording the pharaoh's funerary treasures, Carter began investigating his three nested coffins. Opening the first, he found a shroud adorned with garlands of willow and olive leaves, wild celery, lotus petals and cornflowers, the faded evidence of a burial in March or April. When he finally reached the mummy, though, he ran into trouble. The ritual resins had hardened, cementing tooth to the bottom of his solid gold coffin. No amount of legitimate force could move them, Carter wrote later. What was to be done? 
The sun can beat down like a hammer this far south in Egypt, and Carter tried to use it to loosen the resins. For several hours, he set the mummy outside in blazing sunshine that heated it to 149 degrees Fahrenheit. Nothing budged. He reported with scientific detachment that the consolidated material had to be chiseled away from beneath the limbs and trunk before it was possible to raise the king's remains. In his defense, Carter really had little choice. If he hadn't cut the mummy free, thieves most certainly would have circumvented the guards and ripped it apart to remove the gold. In Tut's time, the royals were fabulously wealthy and they thought, or hoped, they could take their riches with them. For his journey to the great beyond, King Tut was lavished with glittering goods, precious collars, inlaid necklaces and bracelets, rings, amulets, a ceremonial apron, sandals, sheets for his fingers and toes, and the now iconic inner coffin and mask, all of pure gold. To separate Tut from his adornments, Carter's men removed the mummy's head and severed nearly every major joint. Once they had finished, they reassembled the remains on a layer of sand in a wooden box with padding that concealed the damage. The bed where Tut now rests. Archaeology has changed substantially in the intervening decades, focusing less on treasure and more on the fascinating details of life and intriguing mysteries of death. It also uses more sophisticated tools, including medical technology. In 1968, more than 40 years after Carter's discovery, an anatomy professor x-rayed the mummy and revealed a startling fact. Beneath the resin that cakes his chest, his breastbone and front ribs are missing. Today, diagnostic imaging can be done with computed tomography, or CT, by which hundreds of x-rays in cross-section are put together like slices of bread to create a three-dimensional virtual body. What more could a CT scan reveal of Tut than the X-ray? And could it answer two of the biggest questions still lingering about him? How did he die? And how old was he at the time of his death? King Tut's demise was a big event, even by royal standards. He was the last of his family's line, and his funeral was the death rattle of a dynasty. But the particulars of his passing away and its aftermath are unclear. Amenhotep III, Tut's father or grandfather, was a powerful pharaoh who ruled for almost four decades at the height of the 18th dynasty's golden age. His son, Amenhotep IV, succeeded him and initiated one of the strangest periods in the history of ancient Egypt. The new pharaoh promoted the worship of the Aten, the sun disk, changed his name to Akhenaten, or servant of the Aten, and moved the religious capital from the old city of Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, known now as Amarna. He further shocked the country by attacking Amun, a major god, smashing his images and closing his temples. It must have been a horrific time, said Ray Johnson, director of the University of Chicago's research center in Luxor, the site of ancient Thebes. The family that had ruled for centuries was coming to an end, and then Akhenaten went a little wacky. After Akhenaten's death, a mysterious ruler named Smen Kare appeared briefly and exited with hardly a trace, and then a young Tutankhaten took the throne. King Tut, as he is widely known today, the boy king soon changed his name to Tutankhamun, living image of Amun, and oversaw a restoration of the old ways. He reigned for about nine years and then died unexpectedly. 
Regardless of his fame and the speculations about his fate, Tut is one mummy among many in Egypt. How many, no one knows. The Egyptian mummy project, which began an inventory in late 2003, has recorded almost 600 so far and is still counting. The next phase, scanning the mummies with a portable CT machine donated by the National Geographic Society and Siemens, its manufacturer. King Tut is one of the first mummies to be scanned, in death as in life, moving regally ahead of his countrymen. A CT machine scanned the mummy head to toe, creating 1,700 digital X-ray images in cross-section. Tut's head, scanned in 0.62 mm slices, to register its intricate structures, takes on ED detail in the re resulting image. With Tut's entire body similarly recorded, a team of specialists in radiology, forensics, and anatomy began to probe the secrets that the winged goddesses of the gilded burial shrine protected for so long. The night of the scan, workmen carried Tut from the tomb in his box. Like pallbearers, they climbed a ramp and a flight of stairs into the swirling sand outside, then rose on a hydraulic lift into the trailer that held the scanner. Twenty minutes later, two men emerged, sprinting for an office nearby, and returned with a pair of white plastic fans. The million-dollar scanner had quit because of sand in a cooler fan. Curse of the pharaoh, joked a guard nervously. Eventually, the substitute fans worked well enough to finish the procedure. After checking that no data had been lost, the technicians turned Tut over to the workmen who carried him back to his tomb. Less than three hours after he was removed from his coffin, the pharaoh again rested in peace where the funerary pre priest had laid him so long ago. Back in the trailer, a technician pulled up astonishing images of Tut on a computer screen. A grey head took shape from a scattering of pixels and the technician spun and tilted it in every direction. Neck vertebrae appeared as clearly as in an anatomy class. Other images revealed a hand, several views of the rib cage, and a transection of the skull. But for now, the pressure was off. Sitting back in his chair, Zahi Hawaz smiled, visibly revealed that nothing had gone seriously wrong. I didn't sleep last night, not for a second, he said. I was so worried. But now I think I will go and sleep. By the time we left the trailer, descending metal stairs to the sandy ground, the wind had stopped. The winter air lay cold and still, like death itself, in this valley of the departed. Just above the entrance to the Tooth's tomb stood Orion, the constellation that the ancient Egyptians knew as the soul of Osiris, the god of the afterlife, watching over the boy king. Source, National Geographic, Volume 207, Number 6. So friends, if you found this useful, please like, share and subscribe to the channel and also hit the notification button so that you never miss any more videos from this channel. And thanks for listening.